Hey everybody, welcome back to the shop. So recently, I found an ad for this Delta 9-inch bandsaw. Um, I picked it up for $20. The owner said they used it once. They didn't like how it operated. And so they uh, wanted to get rid of it. I don't really know how old it is. I think it's an older model. Um, but I'm going to do a little walk around and show you some of the things that I like about it. Um, I know these small bandsaws t tend to have a bad reputation for being cheaply made. And this one may not, I mean it may be the same or it may be the exception. Um, I'm not sure. But I'm going to show you some things that I like about it and what I think gives it potential. And then we're going to try to figure out what's wrong with it or why it didn't perform to the previous owner's expectations. Well, you know, like a lot of these things these days, it comes with the handy dandy light. I'm, I personally am not a fan of add-on accessories. I would have preferred to have something like on a uh, scroll saw that would blow the dust away from the work area instead of a light. I have plenty of light in my shop and I don't need an extra work light. It looks like it'll be easy enough to remove because it's just on a bracket here and it's got its own separate power cable so I'll probably be discarding of that as you can see my 14 inch delta also has a light that kinda just dangles out there and gets knocked around my jet um, drill press has a light but it's actu actually integrated into the unit itself which makes it a little bit more convenient because it's out of the way. But I digress. This one has a light that I'll never use. The motor is a one-third horsepower uh, motor which is more than enough power for a bandsaw of this size. Lots of information. I swear this thing looks like it has only been used once. Um, so let me talk about some of the things I like about it. Um, you know, the table's okay. I mean, it's a, it's aluminum. It's nice. Uh, looks like it was uh, surfaced on the top. Um, if we look down here, we have this um, cast aluminum trunnion, single trunnion, which isn't the best, but it'll do. Uh, plastic knob. Plastic gear, not that great. The whole rear casing, everything is all aluminum. And then the front is plastic, which is fine. The front doesn't need to be anything else but plastic. It helps save on weight. Here's the internals. It is a, it's not direct drive, it is belt driven, as you can see in there. And so, um, miter gauge that I will more than likely lose within a few days. Okay, so <clears throat> it's got a decent uh, tensioning mechanism, tracking mechanism in the back, that's all fine. I'm a little concerned about the plastic knob on the tracking mechanism. I bet you that will break if I use this a whole lot. Um, got a nice set of brushes to keep the urethane wheels clean. These are urethane wheels, which is nice. Um, right off the bat, as I look, I can tell that the blade isn't, in, isn't tracking in the right position on the wheels. And there's a whole bunch of other setup issues down here with the blade guide. Um, I do like the blade guide. It is a nice, fully adjustable blade guide. So you have a locking nut here little rack and pinion to raise and lower it. It's got friction guides on the sides and it has a little thrust bearing in the back. So this is like the baby version of the setup that I have on my on my Delta here. My big Delta. So that's nice. If we compare it to a more professional grade um, I don't know if you'd call it professional grade, but a little bit higher quality, excuse the mess over here, but 
my 17 inch Grizzly uses ball bearing guides on the sides. It has a thrust ball bearing as well. It's a little bit beefier. But for the light duty work that this little 9 inch saw would be doing, friction guides will be plenty good. Uh, they're not adjusted properly. There you go. And the blade seems to be contacting the rear bearing. So I'll address all that in just a minute. I'm going to pull the blade off, make sure the bearings are good on the wheels, and, uh, and then we'll get to that point. Okay, so let's look at the top wheel first. These brushes. I mean, it, it's loose because it's not under any attention right now. And that pivoting is what allows it to track the blade. Um, but what I want to do is, I'm going to need both my hands, so I'm going to put you back on the tripod. But I'm going to lift it up so it's not in contact with that brush down there. And then I'm going to spin it and see how well it spins on the bearing. Um, see if I can detect any wobble. Well, I would call that good. Uh, it seems to have no problem with the bearing and there's no wobble in the top wheel which is great. Let's check the bottom wheel now. Alright, I'm going to pull the little brush out of the way just so it doesn't create friction and I'm going to spin this wheel. bit of noise. I'm not sure where that noise is coming from. That could just be, it's a cog belt. And so I think that might be the slight noise of the cog belt interfacing with the cog gears. I don't think it's a bearing. I don't feel vibration like, a, like it's a bearing issue. I would say that's pretty good. So that's good. I'm going to make sure those brushes are interfacing with the wheels. Okay, so the mechanicals are good. Um, if you want to see here, I can turn it on. Motor works fine. We're good. One thing I did notice when I was playing around with this is that there's a certain amount of side to side movement on this whole assembly when I lock it down. And I'm hoping I can fix that. Because what happens is when it's loose, I'm not really seeing it right now, so we'll see what happens when the blade's in it, but it, it feels like the whole assembly shifts to the right when um, I lock it down with the lock nut, 
and so it kind of, I don't know, it's almost like it's twisting it, and so it pushes the blade really close to this guide, which also pushes it towards the the center post of the drive bearing, and there's evidence that the blade is riding on the post instead of on the bearing because there's a lot of wear on the post and a little C-clip that holds the bearing in place. Um, and I will uh, kind of zoom in and maybe get you a better look at that. Alright, take a look at this bearing. and Hopefully it's in focus for you. It's not actually the bearing that I'm looking at. Um, there's a lot of scoring and damage to the center post and also to the C-clip that is holding the bearing in place. And I believe the blade is, when it's getting, when the wood's being pushed into the blade, the blade's supposed to push into this bearing and spin the bearing, but it's actually pushing into this post. And there's a reason for that, and there's a, an adjustment for that that'll keep that from happening. Okay, I just loosely put the, put the blade back in, and you can see it's rubbing up against that retaining clip that's in there. None of this has been adjusted yet, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pull out this bearing. I'm going to show you why that this is an avoidable problem. This bearing is on an eccentric shaft, so that means that the the spot where the bearing mounts to the shaft is not the exact center of the shaft, and maybe if I hold the bearing and I spin the shaft, you can see that it's off center. So that makes it so that's how you adjust the side to side uh, movement of the of the bearing in relation to the blade. So what I'm going to do is I'm put it back in, and then I'm going to rotate it until the bearing, just the edge of the bearing, will be coming into contact with the back side of the blade. In the meantime, you can see here, maybe, what I was talking about. When the, when the blade guard is locked down, or the blade guide is locked down, it pushes itself out to the right um, and then it's pretty much rubbing the actual blade guard yoke against the blade and not just the blade guide. Um, so I'm going to have to figure out, I, I bet you I can shim this whole assembly to keep it from doing that. Um, when, I, when I release it, you know it's loose. But as soon as I lock it down, it goes right back into that position. So I'm going to try to f see if I can't fix that right now. All right, so I, all right, so I took the blade guide apart, and this is the mechanism that adjusts it up and down, and then it locks it. And what happens is there's this little plastic collar, and it wraps around the shaft like so. And then when you lock it, it pushes that shaft up against the body of the bandsaw and that's what essentially locks it into place. Pretty decent um, setup, it's not terrible, you know. But here's this is where I think we're getting that twist in the blade guide. First of all, there's a lot of play in the interface between the blade guide and the bandsaw. Second of all, there's a bit of play between this bushing and the blade guide. Third, there's a lot of play inside this pocket where the blade guide, you know, resides. And so when you're turning this knob to lock down this blade guide, it act it's actually want making the blade guide want to twist that way. When the blade guide twists that way, it also twists this, or I'm sorry, I don't know what you call it. When, when the locking device twists counterclockwise, it also makes the blade guide want to twist counterclockwise. 
And so I think all of these large tolerances are kind of accumulating and it's making this want to twist when I lock it down. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to shim this inside the pocket because this is the one that moves the most and we'll see if that makes any difference whatsoever with the adjustment. Alright, well, I shimmed it out with a couple of business cards. This is just, I guess you can call it temporary, unless it works, and then it'll become permanent. So I'm going to reassemble everything and see if that does anything for us. Okay, so before I do any more adjustment with the blade guides, I want to get the tracking right on this guy. And so you want to, you want to do your tracking under the correct tension and do I know what the correct tension is? I don't. I just kind of play it by ear so that sounds good the deflection is good. So now I'm going to find out where this uh, blade lands as I spin the wheel. And I want the blade to land directly in the center of the wheel so it takes full advantage of the crown because the wheel has a little bit of a, a crown to it and that's what helps keep it straight. So now it's pretty close. I'm going to go ahead and turn on the the uh, turn it on for just a couple seconds to make sure it finds its home. Um, you want to stand back when you're doing this without when the covers aren't on. All right, looks good. Last thing you want is to have. Uh, you know, a bandsaw blade fly off at you. So now I'm going to do some adjustments with the blade guides. Alright, so something tells me I'm just going to have to live with the blade being closer to the left side than to the right side. And as long as it's not touching metal, I really don't care that much. Now that I have the blade in the right position, I'm going to, I should have put this in previously, but I didn't, but I should be able to sneak it in here still, yeah. Okay, so, I want to move my blade guides up to where the, um, the uh, friction pads are just behind the gullet of the teeth. You don't want the friction pads to be on the teeth, because if, you end up making a turn, a curve, and it twists the blade one way or the other. You don't want to drive your teeth into the pads, into the guides. You want, because you'll ruin your teeth that way. You'll take the set out of the teeth, or you'll make them dull, whatever the case may be. So you want it to be just behind. I don't like how this, you, you can do this, because this is useless. This does nothing for me, so I wish there was a way to keep it level, but there isn't. Maybe once I lock it down, it, it'll level itself out. Okay. That's good. Now this, I told you it's an eccentric shaft so I can put a screwdriver in the back maybe there we go and you can see as I spin the screwdriver you can see the bearing moves in and out so I want it to move out 
Another slight design flaw is that the bearing actually collides with these blade guides down here, so you can't really get a full turn, but I think you can get enough. I want it to just make sure it clears the shaft and the retaining ring, and it only rides on the bearing itself. So, right about there, and tighten that down. Actually, I don't want to tighten it down yet. I have to set the depth. So, real easy thing. Let's just use a credit card, or a credit card, not a credit card, a business card. Use a business card, push it up against, lightly, up against the, uh, the blade, the back of the blade, and then tighten. So the blade should run the way you want this, this, this rear guide to work is you want the blade to not be in contact with the guide while it's running without a load. As soon as you put a load into it, then you want that you do want it to push into this bearing. So we will test that out once I get everything else set. But right now I've just got a tiny tiny gap between the blade and the bearing. And that's what I want. Same thing goes for these, these side guides here. Go ahead, go ahead and use my credit card again and my business card. I don't know where my mind is today. Lightly push that against the blade. I don't want to deflect the blade at all. And tighten it down. Alright, do it on this side. And there we go. So now once you've got everything adjusted, you want to go ahead and turn on your bandsaw um, because it will, running it might make it shift a little bit and you might need to readjust. Let me get this cover. All right. So as long as you can run it and you don't hear the bearing, this bearing running, and you don't hear any rubbing on your blade guides, you should be good to go. Um, the only other thing that I think is going to be difficult with this model because of the issues that I have with the, uh, you know, with the blade guide, with its up and down movement, one thing you you should test is you go ahead and unlock it, bring it down pretty close to the bottom and then lock it and then do your test and make sure it's not rubbing on anything which it is in my case so I'm gonna go ahead and loosen up this blade guide here because you don't want to have to readjust these every time you move And then, and then the next thing you do is you, you, you bring it all the way up to the top and you do the exact same test. So you can hear it, it's engaging the bearing now.
that was the, the noise of the the bearing. Um, I think I'm going to leave that though because I, I rarely will ever have it up in that position. So even, even dropping it a half an inch, you know, has taken away that problem. So I think that's just something to do with it being maxed out at the top. So it's all set up. I'm not an expert on setting up a bandsaw. I just want to give you that disclaimer. If you want to learn from an expert that sets up these, and he's pretty much the go-to man. He goes to all the woodworking shows. He is the bandsaw guy. His name is Alex Snodgrass. I will link to... Uh, I'll link his information in the description uh, down there below. All right, I got this guy all set up. Let's go ahead and do some testing. Um, I've got a piece of oak flooring here. We'll test that out. I've got a piece of walnut that we can try. And then we'll try its cutting capacity. I'm going to do a full, it's just a 2x4, but we'll see how well it performs um, using the full cutting capacity of the saw. We'll start with the oak. Here's the cut edge. I mean, there's there's not even any saw marks. This is I was actually kind of impressed. So that was the oak. Next is the walnut. If it looks like I struggled, it's just because I had that blade guide a little too low, and so I was actually fighting the blade guide. But again, I'll try to show you. Um, right now, I, I don't know how new that blade is. That blade came with the saw, but uh, no saw marks whatsoever. No burning. Uh, no tear out. Pretty decent. All right, now let's do the 2x4. There you go. Nice clean cut. I did a little bit of a curve. Just um, you could you heard it bog down a little bit. You know I had to slow my feed rate a little bit. Um, but I have to admit I'm pretty impressed with this little guy. Um, I know it's not. This is probably a little bit higher quality. It probably, when it was new, probably cost a little bit more than your standard $100 skill saw you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever. Um, you know, Delta used to make really good equipment, um, and I don't know how old this is, so this could have been back from that time. Um, but as you can see, sharp blade, and, and if you adjust your saw correctly, 
even the cheapest little nine inch bandsaw, you'll be able to do a lot with this saw. As a matter of fact, I probably would be able to do almost as much with this guy that I would normally use my 14 inch, my 14 inch saw for. Um, the 17 inch saw I only use for resawing and milling. So, this is definitely a keeper. I just gotta find a place to store it and um, and then, uh, I don't know, you'll probably see it in some upcoming videos. I hope you liked this video. If you did, throw me a like. Go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Ring the bell for notifications. I try to upload as often as I can. I don't upload as often as I used to, I know. Leave a comment down below. I read every single comment and I try to respond to every single one. Uh, thanks everybody for watching and I will see you next time.